Welcome to the MBS Show Reviews. I am your host, Norman Senzo. Joining me today is a longtime friend, Alpha Rudy. Hey, how's it going, guys? Fine, fine. How, how have you been doing? I'm doing good. I'm here representing the US of A on the Malaysian Brony Show. I think I should say right now, I did not vote for Trump <laughs> because I know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I represent the real USA. America. <laughs> I thought you want, I thought you guys wanted the fence. You know that fence. Oh, it's a wall. It's a big, beautiful wall. <laughs> we have crumbling infrastructure, but we're gonna spend billions on a wall. Then no, I thought Mexico was going to pay for it. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> That's my other podcast. <laughs> yeah, you do a political podcast, but yeah, this, this is not it. This is not it. This is the discussion show or review. But you know, today is the just discussions like. I know you for a few things. You were the host for Brony Time and also um, Bronyville. And then yes. one thing I do know that you are a hardcore fan of Assassin's Creed, the brand, the game. Yeah, it, it was my it's my uh, first true love, I guess, <laughs> as far as like fandoms go. So uh, I've been a fan of the series since the the very first. Mm. And one of the few things that I am interested in is getting to know the series because the Assassin's Creed series is almost as in-depth and confusing as Jojo's Bizarre Adventure. (laughs) Yeah, it's it's a pretty, um, I I don't want to say convoluted, but Uh, in-depth. Yeah, I agree. (laughs) Which is one of the fun things when they talk about because now they're starting to cross so many different platforms now, both uh, on the new game engines uh, but also into new mediums like the movie that just came out, the comics and the books. So it's um, there's a lot of lore behind it. Yeah. So basically, what I want to do is, or what I want to know is, just hold up with this. I want to get into the series, but I don't know. Since this new age of media going on, it's like if you play something, do I have to start from the very beginning and go all the way to the very end and then watch the movie? Or is that non-canon and stuff? Like, I want to know what is canon and what is not. Or can I just open a wiki page and just read everything one shot? Oh, well, here's the cool thing about it. And one, I, one thing I really like about what Ubisoft has done with Assassin's Creed and the lore, <clears throat> um, they have um, had it figured out for a while. Uh, and everything is canon. Oh. Everything that is officially Assassin's Creed is canon, uh, which is cool because if you go to like Star Wars, uh, there's like the extended universe, which has always been up in the air. Like, is it canon? Is it not canon? And now that Disney took over, now everything that was not the original movies before Disney took over, it's all been scrapped. And now, now going forth, everything is canon. But Ubisoft has done a very good job of uh, keeping control of all the different aspects of the uh, the different mediums that they're telling the story through so that everything remains canon. And uh, there was actually an interview like done back after, uh, right before Assassin's Creed 4 started uh, because that's when sort of like the, the main narrative of the reason for the, uh, the modern storyline changed um, as far as their perspective and everything. And, uh, they, they were asked, like, you know, where's this going? And, uh, the director at the time said, we know how Assassin's Creed is going to end. We know what's going to do. So at any point, if we decide that we need to end the series, we can go to that end game. So, and it all fits in too. So it, it all makes sense. And you have references from the game in the movie, uh, also in the books. Uh, like I'm reading the new book that just came out, uh, uh, Heresy. Uh, which actually talks about the new Animus, which is in the movie. So they're all making sure that everyone's on the same page, which is great, because now you don't have these issues they have in other fandoms where, like, well, that's not canon. Well, that is canon. Where did this happen? Like, Ubisoft, they got it all figured out. It's all part of the story. So no matter, no matter where you jump in in the series, there's a couple different points where you can say, okay, now I'm going to jump in, and they'll bring you up to speed, but you never feel like you're reading the wrong thing or what you're reading is pointless or not part of the story, which is something that's always bothered me with other fandoms and medias. Hmm, all right, all right. So basically, if I pick up anything, like one of the best um, Assassin's Creed game I heard was the pirate one where Kenway Saga, what was that called? Um, yeah, Black Flag. Yeah, Black Flag. So if I pick Black Flag up, I can just totally understand the whole series? Yeah, what they'll do is um, it'll bring you in and it there's stuff that obviously... 
if you know the series and the characters, you'll pick up more stuff, but they do a pretty decent job of explaining stuff in and like going over like who all these different characters are. So it's, uh, it really doesn't hurt you to pick up the game at any point. Uh, there are certain games which are definitely milestone games where it's like, okay, now we're starting this new series and this is where things are going to start from here on. There's a couple of different jumping points, like Assassin's Creed 1. You could skip that one um, because all the other games like always refer back to it and sort of catch you up on that. So if you want to start with the Ezio Saga, you could start there. If you want to start with Assassin's Creed 3, you could start there. And if you want to start with Unity, which is the new uh, generational platform, I think those are all the really good like starting points for the game. Because that's where there's a big, a huge uh, sort of narrative shift and sort of takes you on this new sort of chapter, if you will. All right. So basically, any any point you pick it up, it's just going to be cool then. Yeah, you'll have like some like questions and stuff, but it does a pretty good job of like leading you through the lore. And um, it's cool because like, um, like with uh, Black Flag, which is the the pirate one. With that one, it's is the when it introduces the um, the first person narrative in the in the uh, modern series because there's always the modern day setting and there's always the uh, historical setting. And uh, for the first, uh, th- uh, well, Assassin's Creed one, two, the spinoffs, and then three, you were uh, playing as Desmond Miles, who is the uh, ancestor who's going back to visit see his ancestors past. Uh, but after four, it becomes uh, an it goes into first person mode where you're not Desmond, you're just someone who's working for Abstergo. Uh, and you start to pick up things about the past. And as you're walking around the modern day setting, uh, you'll see things where it references like old games and they talk about the different characters and stuff. So depending on how deep you want to get into lore, like I said, there's always room to dig. Mm, all right. And that, that's been really creative because they'll show, uh, <clears throat> cause by the time four comes around is that, the animus, which allows people to go back in time and experience their ancestors, has been sort of uh, commercialized, and it's called the Helix, and it's a gaming system now, <laughs> like VR. Oh. Uh, and they're using pretty much using users to go back and find information and collect data for Abstergo, which is the Templars. And so you'll find these, um, as you're going through, you'll find these little entries about previous assassins and previous stuff that happened in other games. And it's like, how are we going to put our Abstergo spin on this to make it so we're not the bad guys? Uh, and it, so that's neat to see that. That reminds me of a gaming console. Hmm. Something with an X. I don't remember. Yeah. <laughs> it, by the time, like when uh black flag came out, because the whole thing, if you don't know at this point, well, I guess that's why I'm here is you have the assassins and you have the Templars, which are the two, Secret shadow organizations that have been fighting each other behind the scenes all throughout time. At this point in the modern day, uh, the Templars have called themselves Abstergo, which is a, and they're a multinational company. Uh, and they have all these different facets and they, um, they created the Animus so they could find the pieces of Eden and find out lost technology and everything. By the time four comes around, they've, uh, they don't need a direct ancestor anymore to use it because it used to be I could only visit my relatives and get the information. So it pretty much anyone can like read uh, other genetic memories. So basically it's farming things out then. Like I'm just using the World Wide Web to search for stuff. Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so like you're a tester for the new animus system, <laughs> like reliving the histories of the uh, Edward Kenway. Mm-hmm. And like, as you're going through, you're finding out all and they've turned it into a game system. Uh, so that that's how they can like mass produce it to people and gather information. Uh, and so it's weird because like as you're playing Assassin's Creed 4, you're seeing that Abstergo is creating Assassin's Creed games and it's, <laughs> it's like super meta, but it's, it's hilarious. And it, it kind of puts, and Ubisoft has joked about it. It's like, you, so you've modeled this evil organization after yourself. <laughs> it's like, did no one stop and think about that? And they're like, Oh yeah, well, it's still a cool concept. Yeah. Like, well, it is, yeah, but <laughs> but um, talking about very meta narrative, um, I did remember Watch Dogs Two, where you sneak into some gaming development studio and steal one of the trailers or something like that, and said companies use Ubisoft. <laughs> yeah, it's like, mm, and right. that's another thing. Like, there's a hint that the Watch Dog universe is taking place inside the Assassin's Creed universe. Because in Watch Dogs 1, there's a target that you had to, like, take out. And he was the head of the game development of Abstergo Entertainment, who was in Black Flag 4 
And in Black Tie 4, he mentions that he's having to travel to Chicago, and then he goes missing. So those games, like, tie in. There's another sequence where, like, you're uh, in the Watch Dogs one where you're supposed to be, like, uh, like picking up signals from people, and, like, you, you're spying on this guy, this kid who's playing Assassin's Creed and trying to explain the game to his dad. <laughs> and uh, and that also ties in because in now the Assassin's Creed universe, the Assassin's Creed game is now, now part of the universe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's made by, by Abstergo. Yeah, Abstergo. So it does make sense. Yeah, it does make sense. Oh, God. Yeah, so it, it's it. Like I said, when people talk about how in depth the world gets, yeah, it gets pretty in depth. <laughs> uh, all right, all right. So now the real question is the movies, because this is one of the movies that I really wanted to watch last year, but couldn't because of time and nobody wanted to watch it with me. So the, yeah. the real question here is, does this take place in the same universe? Because you've been mentioning to me about Astorgo doesn't need to have a direct ancestor and whatnot, but from the mm-hmm. what you might call the synopsis, I read that oh, this guy named uh, who's this guy named? It's like uh, the main character, uh, Cal Lynch. Yeah, Cal Lynch. He's a descendant of the assassins from Spain and whatnot. Like, okay, um, where does this bring me? Okay, so like even the the comics also talk about this as well too, um, as far as the different uh, systems that are used. So you have the Animus, and the Animus is the device that allows a person to relive their genetic memories. So the idea is that um, the concept behind this, if you want to sort of get into the um, sciencey gobbledygook, is every creature has instincts. How like the monarch butterflies will travel from. <clears throat> like New York to Mexico and take several generations to make that trip, but they always seem to make that migration and other instinctual things we have is because we have like memories that are built into our DNA and how some people are adept at doing things just like their ancestors are, you know, uh, like talents and things like that. And the idea behind with the Assassin's Creed is that, well, it's because we have those <clears throat> memories imprinted in our DNA, just like they get imprinted in your brain. So what the Animus does is it seeks through your genetic code and is able to pull out these genet, um, these memory sequences, uh, allowing the user to pretty much relive those experiences because it's built into them. And so it's just extracting that hard data out and having someone experience it in like a virtual reality setting. So that was the Animus. Then, um, as the game's gone on, it's been getting, uh, more advanced and now they created an animus system where they didn't need they still had to have the genetic memory of the person but now someone else could use it to uh to experience it and then they took it and then they marketed it as the helix system which is where anyone who's not a genetic ancestor can still relive these memories because now that they've been stored and downloaded and can be accessed by other people so if you have a actual blood relative they can use the original animus system and get raw new data and it's also much more extreme experience because it's actually part of them and that's what also causes the bleeding effect which is a side effect of using the animus too much is where that past and present start to collide Mm. and you start to have visions and stuff like that whereas with the helix system it's because it's not a direct ancestor you don't have that direct bond and you don't have that weird side effect so that's how the animus system has uh, evolved over the games all right, then. So, like, by the time you get to the uh, Assassin's Creed Unity and uh, Syndicate, they're no longer using the Animus. They no longer have a direct link. Now they just have this data, and they're using the Helix system. So anyone, i.e. The, you, the player, are able to experience the games in the past without knowing who the direct uh, lineage is in the present. Ah, all right. So that makes things a bit easier. You don't have to hunt down the ancestors and whatnot. All right. Yeah, so with, um, now the deal with the movie is that they're using the animus and that's why they have cows because they want his genetic memory because they don't have that information. So anytime you want, uh, anytime, uh, Abstergo or the Templars want to find out something that happened in the past, a specific time, specific person, they have to track down that ancestor. Now in the series, like once they have that ancestor and they have that DNA code, then they can pretty much hand it off to someone else to, pull uh, to comb through that data uh, using the helix. So that's how that's all connected. <laughs> so to answer your question, yes, they, he's a direct descendant of the assassins. <laughs> all right. So uh, the, so when is this timeline is, is it after 
Astergo made the Helix or before? Um, this one, uh, they're kind of like vague about that, but it's set in 2016. So it is current. So this is after the Helix has been developed. So, um, this is also the, the, if you see the, uh, the previews, they have the giant like metallic swinging arm that comes down. Yeah. That's the latest version of the Animus, which is also talked about in the Heresy uh, book as well. Uh, what's clever is if you like slow down the trailer and look, you see a chair behind um, the woman. I cannot remember her name. Mary, oh, totally forgot her name. The female scientist, as she's talking to Cal, as he's hooked up, you see this like white recliner in the background. That's the Animus from the second game. So you see how they've evolved it. Oh, so I do remember how um the first guy forgot his name the, the first guy who got strapped onto the chair and all the memory was extracted oh, Desmond yeah Miles. Desmond like i do remember him being strapped onto the chair memory extracted and whatnot yeah i do remember that but when i saw the trailer and i thought like huh this character Callum he's getting hooked up to this hook arm thing and being thrown around and whatnot like it does make sense if he's reliving the whole thing he might want to jump and whatnot yeah so it does seem, yeah, I can see it happening, but that's a bit extreme from the chair to the arm. When I was at uh, New York Comic Con, I uh, was able to meet, I know I'm going to butcher his name, Azaya Amar, who's the head of content for Assassin's Creed. Uh, sorry if I butcher his name, I know I did. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, they were talking about this and like why this is such a dramatic shift. And they were talking about like, well, when... Assassin's Creed 1 came out in 2007, VR was pretty much strapped down, sitting down, and you had goggles over your head. Now, you're up and staying around and moving, and like there's a lot more active VR experiences. And so, the idea of like having Cal just like lay down on the table and like strap in was visually boring, but also kind of retro as far as the way VR experiences are supposed to be. Because the Animus is supposed to be this new uh like bleeding edge like sort of space technology and so you have someone experiencing a vr experience in like an antiquated way so like well how do we put it back ahead of the tech curve and so okay we'll have him strap in and actually moves him around so as he's experiencing this he's as actually physically doing all the stuff his ancestor was like having that muscle memory reaction because that's the other thing about using the animus is that the more you use it you're able to gain those abilities. Like Desmond Miles goes back and experiences the life of Ezio so he can learn to become a fighter. So as he experienced Ezio go through all the stuff, he gets that genetic, uh, that muscle memory so he become, can become a fighter and assassin and parkour and everything. So that's now they're actually physically doing it with this new animus system. It helps also, it looks a lot cooler than having someone just lay down on a table for a movie. So you get that more active experience. So there's a couple different reasons why they went to the giant like crane arm animus and all of them uh, just make a better visual and concept reason. Hmm, all right. So basically put in the danger room from X-Men. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that can work. And so I'm, I'm all for it because I liked I, I thought it was a cool touch and I liked it better. So yeah, I, I from the trailers. OK, I haven't seen it, but from what I see of the trailers, I do like the concept of this big arm thing grabbing you and you moving because, well, obviously you're going to get the muscle memory, but your body's not meant for it yet. So, yeah, you're going to jump around, so the arm thing is going to do whatever you need to do. So it's like, we are, yay. Yeah. So that's the device itself. But you know what? Tell me about the story and whatnot. Like, from the Rotten Tomatoes and the IMDb's, it's showing... It's not getting good reviews, and I did ask you on the tumblers, like, was it good or not? Because I'm seeing a lot of people dropping down the hates for it. What I'm seeing on the, from the reviews, like, I, I went opening night, and like, I had a couple friends who got to go to the uh, the premiere the week before uh, for the red carpet event, which I was so so envious of that. I understand <laughs> but, uh, uh, I said, like, you gotta let me know. It, is it good? What happened? And, um, they, uh, said they loved it, you know? And, uh, so all the fans that I talked to loved it. Then it came out, all the critics hated it. And then as, um, 
reviews started coming in, you started to see this really huge divide between the audience response and the critic response. Critics hated it, fans loved it. And I couldn't figure out, you know, why that was. And I was like, by reading the reviews, it's like, well, they just don't understand, like, the uh, history and the lore and everything. So I kind of went into it with an open mind, kind of nervous because I really wanted it to be good. <laughs> um, and I could see both sides of the argument. Uh, and I could see, like, how it could be the second one can be done so much better. And uh, I, I just watched uh, yesterday the um, What the Flick review of it, and they said it perfectly. It's where to start. <laughs> um, I would say that um, because one thing they did really cool, and I'm really glad Ubisoft waited till they had an, a studio that let them keep creative control over it, which I think is really key because it is canon. It fits in with the universe, um, which is really so important. And then it's also handled by a uh, company that really cares about it. And so I, it harkens back to Assassin's Creed 1. Um, Cal is a lot like Desmond as far as, like, he's really not part of the Assassins and really doesn't care about it. And then he's, like, forced to go in and experience the past. And, he, you know, it has a lot of that same carryover. So it feels a lot like the original Assassin's Creed game. Uh, so it's sort of like a spiritual like remake of that, if you will. Mm-hmm. Uh, but of course, it's been updated and everything. The problem with the movie, and I think this is where like fans are complaining about, <clears throat> but also it's sort of troublesome for the critics too, is that a good portion of it, like I would say about 60, 70% of the movie takes place is in the present world, where the real heart and soul of the games is always in the past. And... um it starts off really good because it starts off in the past and you see Aguilar, his uh, ancestor, being inducted into the uh, the creed, <clears throat> into the brotherhood, and um, that whole process. And so, and then it cuts back to the present. Um, because when the game, I mean, when the movie is in the past is when it's all banging on all eight cylinders. And that's where it's really interesting. But they don't do enough of it. They spend a lot of time in the present. And this is kind of funny because uh, what they said on What the Flick is like, they took the part that's the boring, dragged out section of the game that no one likes and made <laughs> that the entirety of the movie, uh, which is true because like even in Assassin's Creed 1, especially Assassin's Creed 1, when you're out of the Animus, all you can do is walk slowly uh, around the room and like talk to the other people, and those are the parts of the game where it really drags. Uh, but of course, that's the time where it comes out and they have to sort of build the lore and explain what's going on, who have, you know... Uh, but uh, I think it was like too heavily done in the in the present setting, um, which was my complaint about it. And it's also a burden with having to catch you up on like ten games worth of lore and books and comics. Yeah, and, and even then they're still leaving stuff out because they they are searching after the piece a piece of Eden, which is usually what all the games are about. But they never really explain where it comes from because that's a whole another huge conversation. Uh, which they're like, you know what, this is so bogged down already, let's just say it's a MacGuffin and we'll explain it later. Which is also sort of one of the <laughs> the things that hurts it. I think they could have kept it cleaner if they kept it simpler as far as like bringing up to date in the lore and spend more time in the past, I think it would have been a lot better. So that's why I say it was like okay. Uh, but it's a, it's a good introduction. But like I said, I just want to see more of the past because yeah. that's where it was... Really interesting. And I'm looking at the wiki page here, and it says that it's 65% present and 35% past. And from what I can yeah. understand, like most of the Assassin's Creed game, the, the fun part was always in the past where you get to yeah. do crazy stuff like climb mountain, no, not mountains, like climb the highest um, part of the building and then do a free fall, leap of fate. Yeah, and that's... And that's the thing about the, what I love about the game so much is that, um, the cool thing about the game is that you get to go back and you see the world, uh, and as, you know, stuff wasn't always what you thought it was. You know, they say the victors write the history books Mm -hmm. and they really like take that in consideration. But, um, I think personally my favorite game is Assassin's Creed 3, the one that takes place during the American Revolution, because they really show these characters, which in America, like, these big guys become like idols or gods, you know, like never besmirch the name of George Washington. But in the game, it really does a real honest portrayal. Like 
he was kind of had his back against the wall and he was short on supplies and people didn't trust in him because, you know, we're going against the British Empire. And then you see him like break his promise and it, it, it makes him human. And like the, in the game, like you have this one final conversation where you're playing a, uh, a game with him. And he's talking about all the stuff he did and like Connor's saying like, you know, you didn't keep your word or you, and they have this argument and it's really interesting to see the world that really was, you know, these are people who did good things and they did bad things, you know, and how history remembers you. Uh, and I think that's where the real, the cool soul of Assassin's Creed lies is putting you in these time periods with these people to see what they're really like, uh, for better or for worse, you know? And so, like, with uh, the movie, like, lack that. Because uh, it, it takes place during the Spanish Inquisition, which lasted. Uh, I, I, they actually had this, like, timeline on their, uh, on the Assassin's Creed movie page where it's it lasted until, like, I think the 1950s or something. I mean, it wasn't officially closed, you know, but uh, there's a lot of hand- That's not a word! That went down during the time frame where the, the movie is set. And, uh, like, the public burnings and executions and, like, the torture and stuff. And, uh, the movie only talks about this one public execution that took place. And you get to see, like, the, uh, the emperor and, like, for a very, like, short period. But they never really get into it. Uh, which I think really miss it out on because that's such a, a neat storyline in time. There's so much to talk about there because it was such a, uh, especially in this, you know, in America's political environment with, like, a religious, religious persecution because it's, that's what it's about is, like, you know, People who consider weren't Christian were then executed, and then there's this interaction with the um, with the uh, the Muslim king who was like visiting at the time, and it, it, there's like such cool stuff that's happening there, but they never touch on it. You feel sort of robbed because you can see so much of it, and even uh, Aguilar's uh, relationship with Maria, the female assassin, you see in all the previews that he's running around with, uh, like from the uh, movie, you sense that she was an assassin before him. And that she's like really hardcore into the brotherhood and he's still, he's a great fighter, but he's still not in there yet. And there's, there's so much more to do, but they don't touch on it because they want to spend time in the present talking about stuff. <laughs> it's, yeah. uh, I feel what you're saying here because I do understand trying to set things up, but wouldn't it be much more fun for the movie to be just the movie? Like, Setting up stories and just the pat, yeah. yeah. I mean, like, like if they really went like <clears throat> if they took the concept and made ninety percent of the movie in the past, I think it would have been so much more interesting because then you would have got to because like the whole like adage of movies is show don't tell, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and this went the completely opposite way. It's like where we're gonna tell you about the apple of Eden and we're gonna tell you about who the assassins were, and and so it's a lot of the present sequence. Is, uh, Maria Collier, that's her name, I think, uh, isn't that right? I gotta look it up now. Yeah, it's, <laughs> this is bothering me. <laughs> well, uh, Wikipedia just calls her Maria. Okay, yeah, so her, and she's like, uh, she's one of the, uh, uh, yeah, Sophia Rickon, that was her character oh, name. Okay. Uh, so she's a Templar, uh, scientist who is create, who created the new Animus. Um, and actually the Rickens, are actually mentioned in one of the other Assassin's Creed games. So like I said, it's all tied in the universe too. Um, and even one of the other guys, uh, Michael K. Williams character, uh, who's one of the other sort of captives at Abstergo, who's also an assassin. He is a descendant of one of the characters from Liberation. You have another woman who is a, uh, descendant of uh Shao Zhen from the Assassin's Creed Chronicles. So like if you're if you're a fan, there's all these Elise rigs thrown in and showing how the worlds are connected. So they do a great job there. <laughs> but um begin back on on track is that uh a lot of the present day sequence is uh Sophia Rickin explaining to Cal uh who the assassins are and explaining the world instead of just letting us go back and experience the world as uh, as Aguilar, hmm. you know. Well, I do understand uh, for moviegoers where if you throw them into a universe where there's two parts of it, like there's the present day and the past, like if you throw them into a universe and show them, uh, let's just say, 
65% of the past and just show them 35% of the present, it will confuse a lot of people in terms of what is going on. I don't understand. I kind of harken it back to like the, the original Matrix. Like that, it's got that same effect as like, here's a virtual reality world and here's a real world. Most of that movie was set in the, in, in the virtual, in the Matrix. And, uh, it started you off there and, um, they busted away to the present and had some like exposition where, uh, Morpheus explained like, you know, what the war was and how the Matrix worked. But for the bulk of it, it was set in the, uh, the, and I think this could have done the same thing. And I think they should have done the same thing. Where if you're going to explain the pieces of Eden, it should have been done in the past. If you're going to explain who the assassins are and who the Templars are, it should have been done in the past, like the games were, you know. Mm. And every time you need to like pull back and like, okay, let's uh, do a little bit better explanation or talk about more of what we're seeing. That's what the present day sequences were used for. And I think you know is is that sort of weird balance. It's hard to say that it was bad. It was burdened by itself. And I think that was like the real issue, uh, the present day, cause they had, they had to like catch you up on everything, explain what was going on. And, but at the same time, trying to keep things aloof. And that, that's really hard to do when everyone's trying to be aloof about what's going on and not really explain to Cal why they're trying to get the, uh, trying to get the apple of Eden. So that's why you get this weird mixture of like, we're like dumping tons of info on you, but at the same time, not telling you why. And that becomes the issue. And, uh, cause I saw it with my wife who said it was all right too. Mm-hmm. And, uh, she has a passing knowledge of Assassin's Creed because she lives with me. <laughs> uh, I try not to uh, regurgitate everything on her because she's sitting nearest to me. <laughs> uh, but she has a fleeting idea of Assassin's Creed. And I think one of the issues that the movie had is like when it gets near the end, uh, we were talking about this and the way some characters did stuff. Like me, and we're both looking at it from two different perspectives. Me, who's like totally integrated in the series and her who has a fleeting knowledge of it. And we had different takes on the same character motivation, like near the end. Like, well, I thought she was like that. Why well, I thought she wasn't. And like, because it, like I said, it's like so dense yet at the same time, so shallow with the way it's portrayed. We didn't know like why certain characters were doing or how much they knew about stuff. So you got that kind of weird middle ground like well where it came off is like well no one knows what's going on <laughs> all right so uh, you, you both seen them i'm trying to like explain it without going oh, into go spoilers hit, man. as much like, as possible go hit. That. <laughs> the chances of people watching assassin's creed after looking at uh, the metacritic and also the rosa domingo <laughs> scores there's a low chance for people going to watch it but yeah th- the reason here is that you like the movie so the floor is open to well, you i'll give i'll give away the I'll give away this for like one spoiler and and it's not really a spoiler. So uh you have uh uh Jeremy Irons and Maria Calliard's characters, Alan Rickon and Sophia Rickon, father and daughter, <clears throat> who are Templars. And the reason they tell Cal that they're looking for the uh, Apple of Eden is because they're trying to find a cure for uh violence. They're trying to cure humanity of violence. Which technically is kind of what it does because the Apple is a mind control device, but they never really explain that in the movie. <laughs> um, because <laughs> it'll get too in depth. But at the end, uh, once they have found the Apple because of the, uh, Aguilar memories, Alan Rickon says, we're able to now destroy the assassins with this. We'll finally be able to kill them all. And she's like, well, why would we do that? We're trying to like save people. And he's like, yeah, and sometimes you gotta, <laughs> break a few omelets to make, you know, break a few eggs to make an yeah. omelet. And at this conversation where she gets really pissed off at him, and this is the part that sort of confused me and my wife, because she, um, I thought she will, because she's a Templar, she's in on the whole final end game for the Templars, you know, and hating the assassins. While my wife thought that she really was trying to do good. So you had that, that sort of like disconnect. It's like, was she always in on the end game to destroy the assassins or was she legit and just wanting to help humanity and create a cure for violence and thought the apple was the best way? So which one was it? And we never got, and like until that end point, it, it sort of like came jarring for me because like, well, of course you're going to kill the assassins. You guys are Templars. That's what you've been doing for the past 10,000 years. I mean, that, that's, that's the whole point here. <laughs> And my wife's like, why would she be upset? <laughs> she would be upset because like he like gamed her like yeah. that. So there's that 
<clears throat> that's part of that issue with the movies because, like I said, it's so dense and trying to catch you up on everything. Yeah, at the same time being so shallow as to not, uh, you know, highlight character motivations and whatnot. Yeah, and so it's, uh, like I said, it's like they should just stay stuck in the past because it's such, it's so easier to yeah. do that. And once again, doing the show, not tell. Uh, and then also, kind of going back to like why it's such an allegory for the first Assassin's Creed game is that I think the second movie, just like the game, will get everything right. And I hope it does. I really do hope they do make a sequel to it and really take the criticism from both fans and, crit- and critics to heart. Mm-hmm. Because there is such a great content there. Yeah, well, they plan to have a trilogy out of this movie or series, but and if they do, stay in the past. And I think that's the thing that pisses people off because you look at the poster; it's of Aguilar. All the promotional stuff they're showing, all the stuff from the past, and that's just like the games. That's where the heart is, and that's when every time it went to the past, it was banging on a late cylinder. Had awesome parkour. Yeah, this really neat storyline that we didn't get to see enough of between like Maria and Aguilar. Now she's like hardcore and like you gotta, you know, uh, really into it. And there's a point she says, if I die, don't you cry for me because I died for the brotherhood. Uh, and that's what we're supposed to do. And him being uh, like not okay with that. <laughs> and so there was such a great story in the past. And I think that when they do the second one, they should just make it 90% the past like it's supposed to be. Cause there you have a really rich and beautiful and it, it was beautifully shot. I mean, it's cool because you had the present which is all cool blue tones and everything's hard edged and linear. Then you had the past, which is more warm tones and uh, dirty and like, it looked amazing, but it's more, you gotta have substance beyond the style. True that, true that. And from what I see here, the gross revenue for the movie didn't really reach the budget. Yeah. The chances of a second movie, like, yeesh, Fox really needs to be okay with a second movie coming out or yeah well hopefully they'll make it up the last uh couple th- uh a couple of th- uh you know a couple million they need probably in like dvd and stuff like that uh and that was one thing also when i was talking with um uh with uh i just call him amar because that's so much easier to say. Yeah. uh because a thing came out uh like a couple months ago where someone at uh Ubisoft said, well, we don't need it to make money. Uh, we don't expect it to. Mm. And that freaked everybody out. And re- as he explained to me, like, uh, when Ubisoft tried to, like, explain his statements is that, you know, they have set aside a budget, so they didn't need it to, like, save the company or they didn't need it to, like, earn this much gross because they had already, like, budgeted properly for. So pretty much you had a bean counter saying, like, yeah, it doesn't need to make money because we've had that all budgeted aside to make this project, uh, uh, which is still a thing to say. <laughs> but, I, no, no, no. I, I, I mean, think the word is poorly phrased because yeah. you don't say, no, we don't, we don't need to make the, uh, we, we don't need to make money out of the movie. I mean, like, we're stupid rich. We have Assassin's Creed and we got the Raving Rabbits. We got Just Dance. Yeah. We got all those games, man. Yeah. But still, it, it, it sucks that if it doesn't turn a profit, which then, of course, would kill the chance of the second one. But like I said, I think if they do it and, like I said, keep control over it because I think that was the best idea instead of trying to rehash one of the other games. I think it was a smart idea to, like, like it, just like everything else, make it part of the canon universe. Uh, but the next one they do, it definitely needs to be in the past because that's where the heart and soul and the things that people love about Assassin's Creed, that's where it is. Mm. Um and, uh, yeah, cause this movie took the parts that no one likes about the game and made it the, uh, it's like, it's going back to the Matrix. It's like if the Matrix was talking about how explaining how the Jack went into the back of people's head for two hours. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's not the function we like, it's the features. Yeah. And <laughs> if we like, really want to know the function, we'll probably do a Google search or read the, you know, buy the art book or buy the, Books, you know, those things that they sell in the bookstore, art books or concept, conceptual books, I don't know. And yeah. So we'll buy those and read up on that. Also, this movie came out in December and there was another movie that came out in December. Star Wars. Yeah. So Assassin's Creed had a lot of fight to just stay relevant, I think. Like, 
Star Wars Rogue One, a Star Wars story. Like that movie may not be um the Skywalker canon or whatever it is, but still it was a really good movie. That one I really enjoyed. That was really good. And I think that's, you got, you're splitting nerd dollars yeah, yeah. <laughs> by putting it in December. Um, but I was like, it, if it's a good movie, it shouldn't really matter like when it puts out because I mean, Deadpool came out in February and that's a death season for no, movies. Really? I mean, but, uh, February, the, it didn't have any competition. So I think that putting, well, the February is always the, the bad time to put out a movie. You talk about like you have the holiday season, you have the summer, the two best times to put out a movie. So, um, they had a choice and they went with the, uh, December release. Mm. Um, but I think regardless, you know, if it's, I think it's got a lot of bad blood or bad press and it's hard for me to not recommend it. I mean, it's, it's, it's all right. I mean, it's a good, it's a solid six for me, right. but like I said, I want it to be so much better and I think it has the potential. And there was a couple other things in the movie that were sort of like, I had a bad feeling when it started and it starts with a scroll. Uh. And trying to explain who the Templars and the Assassins are, it's like, oh damn it, because it's like, oh, with all the exposition the movie had, they still didn't get that basic point across. <laughs> so they had to put the oh, scroll God, at the beginning. No, Assassin's Creed, from what I hear from you talking, is it suffers the uh, show don't tell problem where it's telling us stuff like, oh, this is this, this is that. Like it's not even showing us certain things. Like, hey, the Templars are evil. Just show it in the past. Like, it's easy. Show one scene, Templars killing assassins, and done. Yay. Exactly. <laughs> it had been so much more exciting to see that. Even to have, like, a, like a preposition of, like, here's your target. Like, when Aguilar becomes an assassin, here's your, like, first target as a master assassin. You need to get this Templar. The Templars have been doing this, and da-da-da. And you could do it, like, in the process there. Instead of, like, scroll. Because, like I said... The Templar assassin struggle is never brought up in the actual movie. Now that I think about it, as I'm looking back, <laughs> because even though the Templars are abstergo, they never mention the whole beef between them. Really, yeah, and the wonder your wife had a different point of view when you when it came to um, Sophia. Yeah, she she yeah. didn't have any beef with the assassin, so. She just wanted to make the world a better place. While her father, Joseph, yeah. he, sorry, not Joseph, but, uh, let me see, Rick, um, oh, uh, Alan. Alan, yeah, Alan. He said, like, we must kill all the assassins because they are evil and we are the good guys. And what that, yeah, like at least show us something. I mean, if I didn't play the game or I didn't know anything, I would just be confused. Yeah. So like the, the only way that, gets preempted is like uh like i said that scroll in the beginning say that these because i'm trying to remember if like if they ever talked about the struggle between the assassins and the templars at any point besides that opening scroll i mean you knew that the assassins didn't like them and everything but it, like i said it was it's so weird how like it, it remains so shallow and like i i kind of get like why it was a hard balancing act i mean it had these like sort of built-in issues but I still think they could have gone around it. But I think the way they sort of box themselves in a corner with the way it was done. And like I said, I think if they just stuck to the past, I think that had been saving grace. And hopefully someone's from movie office is listening to this <laughs> and they agree that, okay, Assassin's Creed 2, let's the movie, make sure it's in the past. I, I, I don't think people are Ubisoft are paying attention to this because they don't even care if it makes money or not. <laughs> <laughs> well, they should. Um, actually, I, I think because uh, um, I think if they do the second one's going to take place in the, Revo uh, the Civil War because there was in the sequence where uh, like uh, Sophia is like taking Cal through the their uh, the halls of where they do all their research to find out who's related to who. They show Cal's bloodline. Mm -hmm. And they show an assassin in Civil War gear. And it's actually on one of the posters. There's this one poster where it's got a like, kaleidoscope effect of assassins and weapons. And on the side, you see this uh, sort of a Civil War-looking assassin. And so I think that'd be really cool. I think that's a that's definitely a time period that's just ripe to be at the Assassin's Creed treatment. Brother fighting brother. It'd be really cool to see people... You know, assassin switch Templar, Templar switch assassin, or assassin against assassin. 
especially since the whole like concept of what's cool about the Templars and the Assassins is they're both after the same thing. They want to help humanity. They want to save humanity. Um, the Templars believe the best way to save someone is by controlling them. The Assassins believe the best way to save someone is allow them to be free. And so that's where the whole like split comes in. And I think that Ubisoft has done a great job with the Templars because they're not evil. They're just uh, a different, you know, other side of the same coin, pretty much. You know. Hmm. I I can see that. I can see that. And well, if there is Assassin's Creed movie two, probably yeah. Who knows? The Civil War would be fun. Uh, we don't have much movies involving the Civil War, so yeah, be cool. And I think that they could really do a cool job of, like the games have always done of like really explain who these people are and understand the way that they do the games and the way they should do the movie. Where it's all about the substance of the historical time, which is the heart of the games. And that's the reason I love them so much. It's because you get to see these uh, periods that you hear about briefly or learn about in like history class. <laughs> yeah. You really get to see it explained and go into detail and meet these different characters. And I think that's one, one of the great things about it. The parkour and the combat's always like really cool. Um, and fun too, but I think just the heart of the series is, you know, the tagline for the games is history is our playground. Join us. Mm. And I think that's really the heart and that's what makes the games great is when they really take that to heart. All right, then. And well, say heart a couple of times. <laughs> heart. Uh, but still, it's one of those things where I do hope uh, fans of the series get a second, um, movie out of this. But if not, well, Fox and Ubisoft can learn something from this. And to date, there haven't been any good uh, movie, video game movie um, adaptations, has it? Not really. Um, like I said, this is this is definitely the best video game adaptation. I know that's like a really low bar. <laughs> um, and I say it's good. It's not like great. And um, the reason there have been so many crappy video game movies is you bowl. And I think if you take that out, I think it's because, like I said, style versus substance. Assassin's Creed isn't awesome because there's guys jumping off buildings. It's awesome because of the history and the lore and the the conflict of character and stuff. That's, you know, just like any other good story. It's like, do you have something there to make a story out of? I remember Mortal Kombat. I thought that was a cool movie. You know, it's totally cheesy, especially by today's still, it was. I consider it to be one of the best. Yeah, but it, it was a fun movie. And it got, the, uh, even though it was like PG-13, but it's still, it was a cool, like, action movie, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that there's, uh, Assassin's Creed had the great opportunity because they don't have a linear person. Um, like if you look, uh, seeing another one that I was really disappointed with was Max Payne <laughs> because that one, it was pretty much, it was done for them. Uh, because you had, it was so cinematic and you had the script there, but they totally butchered it and everything and made it weird and had these Valkyries and sci-fi and it didn't need any of that. You know, it was supposed to be just a gritty noir movie and they made it some sort of weird sci-fi movie. And so, like, you have the issues where you're trying to do a direct translation like that, <clears throat> where it's obviously Max Payne and that story, you know. Uh, how are you going to, like, integrate that? Like, well, what do we cut because of time constraints and da-da-da-da-da. But um, something like Assassin's Creed is like, well, we don't have to pick any of the assassins who've been here already. We can do a new story in the universe. I think that's a benefit because then it's not constricting the story or anything like that. I didn't see the uh, World of Warcraft movie, uh, but I heard that was, that one was <laughs> issues. It was popular in China, but in terms of story, it, it suffers from the whole, we need to follow the lore of the story. If not, we're breaking canon and whatnot. It's, I'm not saying that it's bad. It's pretty interesting. Like, I enjoy the movie. Like, I'm not a guy who plays Warcraft. So, yeah, this is one of those things where... I jump in, I get to know, I'm happy. I'm thinking about like even like comic book movies, you know, like the like the, the Marvel universe, you know. Mm -hmm. It's the Marvel's right because now they're controlling their own IPs. Um but if you look at Civil War, the Civil War movie is like nothing like the Civil War comic book, but it's the idea, it's the characters and these situations. That's what holds it together. So even though we're not experiencing the exact same thing, if you're getting the characters right and you're getting that emotional investment right, that's what really matters. I think that's where you're seeing a lot of issues with these comic movies is that they try and make so it looks right. You know, like, look, this character has got the exact same outfit and they're doing the thing and they say the thing that's in the game. Yeah, in all essence, when it comes to video game movies, I'm going to take uh, Mortal Kombat, the original, the first one. To me, that is 
the most perfect video game movie adaptation out there to date. Because, okay, you got all the characters right, depending on the time and budget back then, but you still had those yeah. fun, goofy fighting scenes. Come on, in Mortal Kombat, you get to rip a guy's spleen out. So how serious can you really be? Yeah. So having them do the moves, do the stuff, and just play the role and whatnot, it was good enough. Even to this day, it's a really fun movie. Then you had Street Fighter. <laughs> oh, God. Street Fighter yeah. 94. Well, I think that's... <laughs> I think that's the thing talking about the style versus substance with the, like video game adaptations is because like in uh, like Mortal Kombat, I remember being like oh, like middle mm-hmm. school when that came out. I think I'm trying to remember. I think I was even younger. Plus, plus it was good. Um, it was it was good to date. Like if you would watch it now, it's good. Oh no, no I'm just saying like like when uh, like when Sub Zero and Scorpion first come on screen, you're like yeah, Sub Zero, that's awesome because he looks like um and like as I said, okay. Now what? Now they fight. <laughs> and now they fight. Like that's the thing with with Mortal Kombat. Since uh, MK doesn't have a real story back then, it had this general story of okay, the realm Earth realm versus the underworld, whatever it is, are fighting. So yeah, fight. Whatever you put in between is just yeah. like substance for us. Like go on, we want to see fighting, more fighting. And and I think that's uh like or like even when I look back at uh. Uh, uh, Resident Evil, which I thought was like a really, the first one was like a really good remake. No. Because they follow that same line. Well, here it's, it's in the canon because it takes place before the first game, you know? And then they just went off the rails with all the other <laughs> yeah. ones. But that first one. You thought it was it, good? It had all the stuff. I liked it. I didn't. Like, Great Queen? I was, what? Like, what? <laughs> well, I, I mean, okay, uh, I've seen some of it and in all honesty, I, didn't really like uh, the first Resident Evil movie because it made it weird. Like, you insert a character here and then you made everybody die except for the main character. And then Alice, like... It's a horror movie. Not really. <laughs> well, no, I, like, I... like the, It's so hard to... Because that series has, like, sort of gone off the rails, too. Uh, both in the game and the movie. But I... <laughs> But I like the idea of, like, here's it is, said it, like, before the game and sort of the lead up, like, how things went wrong, you know, um, in the mansion. Uh, so I thought it had a good lead up, and that did a good job of, like, sort of putting it all together. But it's, like, I'm trying to think, like, if if we were to, like, start fresh with, like, a different game. Oh, I just pulled up my Steam and I saw Doom, and I remember the Doom movie. <laughs> Was it a Doom movie? <laughs> Seriously? Oh, yeah, Dwayne. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's. <laughs> oh no! But I think like if they did a like a uh, Elder Scrolls or a Fallout, mm. I think those games are the best because you don't have a character or a certain storyline to follow. Like if they actually did like a Mass Effect, it could be really good because it doesn't have to be about Shepard. It could be Shepard's story, but in all honesty, how would you put it? No, because 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 the with like with Shepard and like if you're doing any of the Mass Effects the game wise it's because then you're trying to do that story but then which storyline are you going to go with because the idea of like let's not be about Shepard let's just put someone let's put our audience in this universe and have an experience happen you know uh, whether it's happening congruent with the Shepard storyline or something else but it's um you have a universe to fill just like you do with Star Wars you know it doesn't have to follow the main guy, you know? Yeah, true. But in all honesty, I I would like to see a Shepard story because Commander Shepard is iconic. So to have Shepard on screen would be awesome. But the, but even like the new uh, Mass Effect Andromeda, it said like a thousand years or 500 years after the Shepard oh, storyline. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, these new characters. That's the reason there because it's a sequel or a continuation to the story. But now, if we're talking about um, movies or adaptations, Mass Effect suffers from too much content we cannot cut. There's certain things we can, but certain things we can't. So I do hope if they do a Mass Effect movie, I hope they take it to the line of TV series like um, Westworld. Yeah, and usually if you go with the TV series, it helps out. Or even like, uh, like I said, like if you're doing like the Elder Scrolls, like if you did a Skyrim movie, 
then you're not bound by anything. You can make the universe whatever you want it to be. I, like I said, I think it's just been too much trying to get the style of it right, and then people freak out when something doesn't fit right. Because I remember even with uh, the original like Mortal Kombat, people were freaking out that uh, Scorpion's dart was like a weird bird head. <laughs> like, what the hell's up with that? It's like, well, it looks better. <laughs> we had the budget. Yeah, well, it wasn't just like a straight dagger. It was like a little screaming bird yeah, yeah. that came out. Uh, yeah, but it was at the time, too. I mean, th- during the time where movie CG effects were considered to be really cool, you, you had to insert something. The budget was there for it. We got to make this more than just an arrow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but no, that, that's besides the point. But back on track with the Creed movie, from a visual aspect, the past seems to be really cool from what I've seen of the trailers. Mm-hmm. But I think what bogs it down is just the present. And that's why I say I can't really like, it's hard to say like, I, I, I still recommend it for people because it's a cool intro to the, uh, series and, uh, it, like the past sequences are amazing. Really, uh, you got about 40 minutes of a solid cool action movie in there. I, it's hard for me to dock it or say don't see it. Um, because it's <laughs> like everything I say about it is yeah, but um, there's this awesome like uh, it's this awesome like faithful recreation, yeah. But then you have to go through all the, like the slog of like explaining the universe. It's like it, yeah, I understand, I understand. I, everything's it's, one hand and the other. It's one of those things where this is a good game, but there's no arcade mode. But it's a good game. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Street Fighter Five, ladies and gentlemen. Still, yeah, it is a good game. <laughs> but if you want to talk about the games, I'll like recommend you which games to start with and which ones all day. I, I've played them all, actually. Oh, and that's another cool thing I want to mention since we're talking about Assassin's Creed: uh, the Humble Bundle. If you go on the Humble Bundle now, they are doing an Assassin's Creed giveaway, so you can pay fifteen bucks and get like ten games. Ten games, almost all of it. Uh, yeah, so you can get a. Uh, like the top sponsors for 15 bucks, you'll get Assassin's Creed, Assassin's Creed 2, Assassin's Creed Brotherhood, Liberation, Unity, all three Chronicles. Wow. Yeah. And I think that's it. Yeah. So one, two, three, four. Oh, Assassin's Creed 3, and then also Tyranny of King Washington. <laughs> so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, you'll get nine games for 15 wow. bucks. That That is a steal. So if you really want to get into the Assassin's Creed lore and help kids with cancer, go to Humble Bundle and uh, pick it up. When is the offer um, last? Nine days oh, left wow. from the 8th. I hope this goes out on time. If not, yeah. <laughs> Put it out. <laughs> I'll try. But still, yeah, uh, Assassin's Creed Bundle, yeah, uh, 15 bucks for almost all of the games. I say it's worth it if you're uh, getting into the series. If not, I'm sure there's always yeah. uh, another bundle coming up soon. Yeah, and I, I, yeah, it's all for the PC, and this is nice too. So it's yeah. If you don't have the PC version, you can always get it on the console, which is going to be even cheaper because of rentals or secondhand copies. So yay! Yeah. So yeah, the, that's Assassin's Creed in a nutshell. Like uh, the movies, okay, but yeah, <laughs> but still, um. See, so, yeah, honestly, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, I wanted it to be amazing, but it's okay. Would I recommend it? Yeah, go see it. Uh, trivia for this movie. The movie has been released exactly four years after Desmond Miles' death in Assassin's Creed 3. If that makes any sense. Yes. So, yay. Oh, you want more on that? Okay. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, Desmond Miles, uh, spoiler, like, dies at the end of Assassin's Creed 3. Um, so, like I said, it's based in canon because he died in 2012 in the game world. And then, like I said, this is set in 2016. So, it's chugging right along as part of the uh, <clears throat> the uh, canon. <clears throat> and it kind of works, too, because it's uh, uh, because they're still using the Animus. And now they got the Helix. And there's all the different parts of the Abstergo company. And fun thing is, if they could do another game movie, Watch Dogs. <laughs> One uh, one guy yeah. would kill the director of a Sturgo or something like that. Yay! 
There are times there. <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if I bet Ubisoft is looking at all their other properties and finding what they want to do something on next. Yeah, true that, true that. I mean, um, the rabbits had their own movie. They could do Splinter Cell. Oh, That'd be yeah. cool. But that's Tom Clancy. Or if they even did like a Rainbow oh. Six. That'd be cool. Who knows? But like, uh, <laughs> but like Rainbow Six, like Siege mm-hmm. and like, uh, The Division. They both have these really, like, really cool like setups, but they never do anything with the stories. When I first I got uh, the division, I like really like psyched because the, the premise is like such a cool like startup for it, and then now it just becomes a loot and shoot. <laughs> and so I think even a game like that, uh, or like even Rainbow Six Siege, um, where they have these like cool premises that they set up, but they really don't do anything with in game, you could really do something with that with a movie. Yeah, but at the same time, you have to be you have to be careful not to kind of go off the rails and make it a generic movie with a uh, Tom Clancy kind of name because well we all know how that went right so yeah yeah but anywho um I do hope that our babble of Assassin's Creed got you interested in playing the game or watching the movies or reading the comics or novels so yeah it, Alpha here is a big fan um I have always been interested in it so who knows maybe a cartoon series animated 3D Series? Who knows? Be cool. They did make the Embers movie, which was a CG animated movie. That was cool. Ah, was it good? Yeah, it's uh, it's the uh, talks about the uh, the last sort of the last chapter for Ezio. Ooh. So, how was the whole thing? Like um, past and present, or all past? It's all past. But, see, this. So it's just. <laughs> yep, there you go. That's all good. Like, that's what we want. The formula still holds. <laughs> yeah, that's what we want. The past. Don't change it. If there's anything you want to know about Assassin's Creed, just let me know. Um, I also did start a a website uh, called AssassinsNexus.com, uh, which I need to update seriously. Yeah, you, you need to put in uh, your rent there, seeing the movies. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, just give me a link and I'll put this on the page then. <laughs> so. All right. We'll do, man. When this out, I'll give you the whole thing. And yeah. I don't want to linger on anymore because if we go along, we'll be just babbling about stuff we <laughs> like. But still, but still. Uh, once again, Alpha, thanks for coming on, man. Absolutely. Thanks for having me and thanks for giving me a chance to talk. <laughs> no problem, no problem. <laughs> I, I've i always wanted to know bits and pieces of the Assassin's Creed universe because I'm too lazy to play the game. I have other games and I don't have much time. So hearing people tell me about it and getting the content that way, it's fun for me to, you know, be involved. Yeah. Oh, one thing that's, like, really cool, too, is that, um, oh, where's that? There's this one guy on YouTube who does, like, the the cinematic playthroughs. Guy, Andy Gillian. He does, like, playthroughs, but he also, like, uh, takes movies, <clears throat> takes the game, like, cutscenes, and then, like, strings them all together in, like, one long movie. Like, he did one for, like, the Assassin's Creed. So he has, like, Assassin's Creed, the movie, and two of them, like, playlist i'll send this over to you here so like you ever just want to catch everything together um and catch up that way i mean because they're all about like four hours long oh, wow. because it's all like, cutscenes. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a great way to like catch up on the storyline without having to play the whole yeah. game so well at least that's one way to do it anyway if you guys have any questions concerns or suggestions for the show you can contact us through the emails um the mbs show at gmail.com or the Twitters at the MBS Show, or personally to me at Norman Sanzo. And Alpha, where can they get you, man? Uh, if you go to assassinsnexus.com, that is my Assassin's Creed site, where I'm trying to sort of like catalog uh, pretty much everything in Assassin's Creed. Um, I need to update my news feed like seriously bad. But the idea is like I'm trying to uh, put together a, a site that gives the, the fandom is so varied and spread, and then every new game there's a new thing that Ubisoft puts out and takes the Phantom in a different direction. Like there was Initiates and then there's this other thing and the Council. And so I'm trying to like catalog it all so you have one stop and then just to spread out from, from that point. Um, and then my other political podcast I talked about is my crazy conservative uncle.com. So there's that too. So anyway, subscribe to the show via the iTunes, YouTube, and YouTube Radio, and also like our Facebook page. Um, everything will be down in the show notes. And yeah, I've been Norman Sanzo. 
And I'm Alpha Brony. And we'll guys catch you next time for another informative video game episode, probably. <laughs> oh, Overwatch, that's a fun game. <laughs> yeah, we can talk about that. <laughs> what can we talk about? How rubbish people are. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god, Tracer's gay. Oh no. no. <laughs> uh, anyway, see ya. Bye. Take care, man. See you later. Like sort of like uh, going on like Ubisoft and like I am uh, I love like the Tom Clancy series games, but I've noticed that like Rainbow Six like Daddy, Siege. Hey Ash, what are you doing? I'm talking. That's my opinion, as I say. Yeah. <laughs> are you just gonna sit here now? Stay. I yeah. wanted to go play a game of Portal Two. Oh. Okay, we'll play Portal later. Okay. I need to play now. Don't worry, I'm in the middle of something. Let's go. Play Here's your game. outtake. <laughs> yeah. Just give me a few minutes, okay, buddy? Then. Yes, then. <laughs> well, though.